Hey, good morning. It's Patricia Murphy. It's Tuesday. This is Seattle Now. Thousands of Afghans who managed to flee the country are starting over, and some are settling here in the Seattle area. We'll talk with one man who left Kabul for the U.S. and an agency trying to smooth the path for him and others. But first, some headlines. That didn't take long. The Omicron variant of COVID now accounts for the majority of U.S. cases. Here in Seattle, the latest numbers from UW say it's showing up in 70 percent of cases. King County has seen a 93 percent increase in Omicron cases, and predictions are more cases of the fast spreading variant are likely. The advice is the same. Get boosted now if you're eligible and get tested if you have any reason to. Meanwhile, a Seattle man who joined the January 6th riot to the Capitol was sentenced to nearly four years in prison yesterday. Court documents say 28-year-old Devlin Thompson violently fought in the West Terrace Tunnel, throwing projectiles, eventually assaulting a police officer with a baton. Thompson pleaded guilty in August. And there could be snow in the Seattle area for Christmas. The National Weather Service says temperatures will be dropping over the next five days, and that could lead to some lowland snow later in the week. I'm obligated to tell you there's still a lot of uncertainty about the forecast, but I'm really hoping for some snow to round out the holiday. The last time that happened was four years ago. Just a few months ago, the world watched as the U.S. ended its 20-year occupation of Afghanistan and the Taliban swiftly seized control. The withdrawal created a crisis with people desperately seeking a way out of the country. Now thousands of Afghans are in limbo across the world, and Washington state will become a new home for some of them. Anila Afzali is here to talk about what's happening right now. She's the executive director of the American Muslim Empowerment Network at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. That's located in Redmond. Anila's organization is a partner with the Department of Health and Social Services to support people arriving from Afghanistan. Anila, really appreciate your time. Thank you for speaking with us. Thank you for having me, Patricia. Great to be here with you. So the crisis at the airport in Kabul was just a few months ago, and thousands of Afghans were evacuated. It was such a monumental event, but I want to try to focus on our region specifically. What role is Washington State playing in the resettlement of some of these new arrivals? Sure. Washington State has been a leader historically and today in resettling refugees from different uh, disaster situations or moments of crisis. Uh, and right now, with the incoming Afghan arrivals, Washington State is expected to be in the top five states for resettling Afghan refugees. First, how many people are we talking about here? And I wonder if that number will change as need arises. So our state, as we were saying earlier, has been one of the top destinations for resettlement of Afghan refugees and evacuees. And here in Washington, from mid-September to December 14th, we welcomed over 1,300 Afghans uh, through the federal resettlement program. And then in addition to that, there's a number of individuals who've been showing up to Washington on their own because they have family or friends or other connections here in our state. And we anticipate at least another 1,000 Afghan arrivals through the federal resettlement program or on their own in the months ahead. Let's talk about visas and next steps for people entering the U.S. from Afghanistan. Sure. So people are arriving, Afghans are arriving under a number of different potential uh, ways. One is the special immigrant visa, and that's a visa that's granted to those individuals who directly worked with uh, U.S. forces uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, there are certain requirements to fulfill for meeting or obtaining a special immigrant or civ uh, visa. Um, but the problem is, is that system was really put on hold, essentially, the processing of civ uh, applications 
vacations during the Trump administration. And that's why so many have had to make uh, take advantage of another opportunity, which is a humanitarian parole program. So humanitarian parole is a way to try to get people out of an emergency humanitarian or political or other crisis, as of course we're seeing in Afghanistan. And uh, USCIS for, for months had not taken any action. And, and a lot of us had been advocating for swift action on these urgent parole petitions that had been submitted by over 30,000 Afghans so far. Uh, and we did start getting responses from USCIS sort of in the beginning of December, the week of December 3rd. What's happening with these humanitarian parole applications? USCIS is the United States Citizen and Immigration Services. What are you hearing about their response to applications? The response that folks started uh, receiving and that, that has been shared with many different organizations working directly with Afghans uh, has been essentially denials. And these denial letters set forth a, a new stringent evidentiary standard. And one of the denial letters that I've seen specifically uh, t- calls for documentation from a third party source, specifically naming the beneficiary and outlining the serious harm that they face. Now, that threat standard, it's, it's really untenable, given the specific circumstances in Afghanistan right now. I mean, the Taliban are not issuing a threat letter and saying, we're going to come kill you. They just go and kill somebody. And the standard that's being used would essentially shut out the overwhelming majority, if not all, of the humanitarian parole uh, applications by Afghans. Anila, can you tell me how people are managing to figure this all out? Because These are people who are processing trauma. This has been an extremely upsetting, life-upending experience. How are they getting through this? Oh, the the trauma is absolutely real. And I will say, as an Afghan-American myself, I personally have family in, in Kabul who I am trying to evacuate as well. That trauma that they have experienced, not only the four decades of warfare and violence in Afghanistan, but even the, the trauma of the Taliban uh, returning to power, seizing power, and implementing their brutal and barbaric regime in a way that is hurting the people of Afghanistan uh, and really uh, in engaging in reprisal attacks against those who worked with the U.S. or allied forces. People are using safe houses. They are moving from from house to house to avoid the door-to-door searches by the Taliban, where they are fearful and they don't know sort of what tomorrow will bring. So it it is a very big challenge right now to address the mental health needs, trauma needs. We specifically have one work group that focuses on health and mental health because we recognize the need to address that trauma. Washington has been a leader in resettling refugees and will become home to more than 2,500 arrivals from Afghanistan. Right now, many Afghans are trying to navigate complicated procedures to get their visas approved and recently have received denial letters. Getting through all of this on top of the trauma of leaving a crisis situation at home is something that many Afghans are facing right now. To hear the experience of one new arrival, I spoke to 26-year-old Kais Jaweed, who came to Seattle in October following the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. He worked for three years at the U.S. Embassy in security positions, which made him eligible for a special immigrant visa. His mother and some siblings are still in Kabul without a clear path to join Kais in Seattle. Kais told me what it was like leaving Afghanistan and first arriving in Qatar. Actually, it was not a journey. It was just a life-saving step. And it was a cargo airplane. There were about three to four hundred people at the same time of that cargo flight. And after traveling five hours, we landed Qatar. The weather was so hot and it is unexplainable that how much it was hot. There was no place for taking shower. There was no fair restroom. Kais was in Qatar for three days, but some people spent more than two weeks there. His next stop was Fort Dix in New Jersey. The situation in New Jersey at Fort Dix camp was good. The main point that I will always remember will be military's behavior. 
uh, they showed a lot of respect, kindness, patience, and support to everyone, especially to those people with disabilities or health issue. They played with the children like their own children. And this is the best thing that I remember. He spent two months in a kind of holding pattern at Fort Dix and didn't get much of an update about his future while he was there. Then, because of a family connection in Seattle that guaranteed him housing, Kais got permission to leave Fort Dix and has started to settle here in the Seattle area. Most of Afghan people that they arrive in the United States, they're trying to select a state that they have some friends or family inside that state because they can guide us for finding a job, for finding a house. I have in here friends and one of my cousin. Without that, it is so difficult to find a way. Seattle is a beautiful and a popular place. I have planned to stay in here if I find a job, a good education opportunity, I will stay. Staying is one thing, but for Kais, it's more like starting over. He'd studied dentistry in Kabul for six years. He told me here he's safe, but it's pretty much back to square one. We have some colleagues, uh, they received their master's degrees in Kabul universities, and they were uh, a master in their field and their profession. And right now in here, they don't know how to start and from where we should start. It means that we are at the beginning step of life. Like we should study again. We should make a house again. We should buy a car again. We should make a career again for ourselves. And everything is at the beginning step. And uh, I don't know what happened next. And everything is unclear for us. And let's see. We try our best. Finally, and most important, is the issue of Kais's family. They're still in Afghanistan. A brother, two sisters, and his mother. His father was an SIV holder because of his work at the U.S. Embassy, and his family was covered under his visa, but they weren't able to evacuate because of the volatile situation at the Kabul airport. This is the big problem for everyone, for everyone that who worked with the U.S., government. You should have education. You should have a place to live. You should have your family. If I can't bring my family from Afghanistan, I will go back to Afghanistan because I can't leave them alone. And this is the point. It's not about me. Most of the refugees that they are in here, they will do the same thing. They will go back to the country to take care of their families. Refugee resettlement organizations are working nonstop to support new arrivals from Afghanistan and have asked for assistance from the community to help with the effort. If you'd like more information about how you can help, check out the show notes. Jenny Cecil Moore produced today's show, which is also made by Diana O'Pong, Claire McGrain, Caroline Chamberlain Gomez, and Jason Pagano. Matt Jorgensen does our theme music. I'm Patricia Murphy. 